Typically, when discussing Devil May Cry, the topic of conversation swings more often than not to the combat and boss fights and a lot of the finer details of the gameplay. And unless I'm having a conversation while playing one of the games with someone in the room with me, I rarely ever discuss the levels that serve as the connective tissue to all of the fighting. It's about time that I correct that. Some of the Devil May Cry games actually have really stellar level design, be it the way that they are paced or the sense of atmosphere that some of them give off. I'm going to exclude missions that are only boss fights, so nothing like Mission 20 of DMC3 or Mission 22 of DMC1. So now that we have the rules out of the way, let's rock. These are my top 10 favorite Devil May Cry missions. This party's getting crazy. Let's rock. This mission begins in a similar fashion to how I'm sure that the opening scene of DMC5 will end. Nero screaming in anguish. <laughs> This mission is mostly a trek through some pretty cool looking environmental hazards. Things like the laser corridor and the room with the spinning blade column were pretty cool to look at, and I never found them too frustrating to get past. Something about the layout of this level always makes me chuckle too. The Order of the Sword's headquarters bounces back and forth from looking like an actual stronghold, with rooms like the meeting room, to some silly death trap since in order to get to said meeting room, you have to make it past the previously mentioned spinning blade column like two rooms before that. One of my favorite parts of the level is the room where you can just hit the Cronus box to slow everything down in the middle of a fight with a group of Angelo armors. I find it to be one of the more fun uses of the key item gimmicks that show up in Devil May Cry 4. The mission ends with a nice boss fight against Dante. Okay, so on normal he's still pretty easy, but on higher difficulties, such as Dante Must Die, he's actually pretty challenging. Busting out the entire bag of tricks with all of his styles adds up to be a battle much more befitting of how you'd expect Dante to fight after spending three games watching him tear through everything. Well, if the kid screws up, then I'll just have to kick his ass. This mission opens with Jester introducing a new enemy the Blood Goils. They aren't the most fun enemy in the world, but their first battle isn't super egregious. After dispatching of the Blood Goils, Dante runs back to the central room of the tower and uses the item he got at the end of the previous mission. This opens up the way to another key, which opens up the way to an item that Dante needs to use to get across the gap that it was in the second room of the mission. Geez, there's a lot of rigmarole to getting around this place, isn't there? Look, it even tests Dante's patience. Once Dante crosses the gap with the Soul of Steel, he catches a ride onto an elevator, and then there's a boss fight right around the corner to finish off the mission. The Agni and Rudra battle is one of the best in the series, and definitely one of the most memorable things about the mission. But aside from the boss battle, I still really enjoyed exploring the tower. Whenever you come across a key item, the game doesn't beat you over the head with, hey, go take the trident back to the room with the trident switch. It just assumes that you remembered where it is, which I really like. I feel like a modern game would just slap an arrow on the HUD, and then that would lead you back to the room that you're supposed to be in. <laughs> No talking. Good. The penultimate mission of DMC3 starts off strong enough. They throw the admittedly cool looking abyss enemies at you, and they run you through a gauntlet of rooms filled with various gimmicks as you fight them. I really enjoy the room where you damage them by hitting the mirror that they show up in. The environments in this mission all look really cool too. The room that's just the pool of blood and the room with the giant hourglass are both pretty simple, but really cool looking. And the area just before the boss fight is pretty sweet looking too. It's got a very distorted abstract kind of look to it. The mission ends with a battle with Arkham, who... Cannot control the power of Sparta. About midway through the fight, Virgil comes to help out and he and Dante team up to take Arkham down in some of the most satisfying cinematics in the series. I just wish I could say the same thing about the actual boss battle. Seriously, Arkham is unimaginative at best and tooth-grindingly frustrating at worst. On normal, he's easy, and on hard, he's not even that bad. But once you hit very hard and Dante must die territory, this fight just kind of sucks. Also, while having Virgil team up with you in-game for the second half of the fight was a cool idea and I really liked it on my first playthrough, I feel like it loses its luster on repeated playthroughs because of its poor implementation. He's just kind of there and you lose the function of whatever style you were using. So while the environments were cool and the cinematics were top tier, the less than stellar boss fight holds this mission back from being as good as it could have been. Not very classy for someone's dying words. Thank you. 
This mission is like Mission 19, but better realized. The bulk of it is a boss battle, but the level leading into it is pretty solid. We've got some decent corridor battles with the chess pieces, and all of the corridors have this really cool looking pale blue light, mixing with a marble texture to give this really intense look to all of the hallways. The light puzzle to get to the key to the boss room is also really cool. I remember feeling pretty betrayed when I played it the first time and they hid the answer behind a breakable wall. Thankfully the boss fight in this level is way better than Arkham. Virgil round 2 gives Virgil a few more tricks up his sleeve, such as a pair of gauntlets and a devil trigger of his own. After the battle we're treated to another pretty memorable set of cutscenes involving all four main characters and Arkham revealing his master plan. We also get to bear witness to whatever this is. Just as gonna spank you, but spank you on the bar. Top notch stuff. Why not? After all, we share the same blood. I'll just use more of yours to undo daddy's little spell. The beginning of this mission revolves around destroying two demon cameras that pulled Dante into limbo. One of the best things about Ninja Theory's DMC to me is the environmental designs. The way that they will take something rather mundane and then turn it into this wacky, hyper stylized circus is a lot of fun. There are several demon fights that all have a decent amount of variation from each other, and I never felt like I was taking too long to deal with either one of the cameras. After dealing with the creepy eyeball cameras, the world itself just starts trying to kill Dante. The walls start enclosing and the floor starts breaking apart, and it does a really good job at making it feel like there's a threat even when there aren't actually enemies on the screen. And I feel like that's another thing that the game does really well with the level design. The level wraps up with a battle inside a church where Dante fights basically everything that he's fought in the mission already, before we are introduced to the tyrant to keep the battle from feeling too samey. The end finally comes after the fight with another platforming segment to make your way out of the church. This mission did a really good job at balancing some of the decent fights with some cool looking platforming and world distortion, and then wrapped it up with a little bit of both. I just seem to drag on forever. Church. Credit to this mission for implementing an environmental hazard that isn't too ridiculous. Yeah, the main gimmick of the level is don't jump from platform to platform while the fire is going. The level is actually more open-ended than I remembered it being too, so it's nice and explorable. This mission also has some of the nastiest fights in the game. Most of them are several waves and consist of some Stygians and a Butcher, or Stygians and a Ravager, or Butchers and a Dream Runner. Okay, now this is interesting. Seriously, Dream Runners are some of the best enemies in the game, and Butchers are also a lot of fun. So this mission knows how to keep you on your toes. This level also has the right sense of escalation. You aren't doing the battles with the Dream Runners until towards the end of the level. It starts out with the more moderately challenging things like Witches and Ravagers and the like. Honestly, between trying to dodge the fire in between the fights, and the fights themselves being some of the best in the game, I feel like this mission is really well paced. Honestly, I feel like it would have made a better, proper final mission than Mission 18 did. So I'm putting two missions in this slot because they just both kind of bleed together to me. Fortuna Castle is one of my favorite areas in Devil May Cry 4, mostly because it actually flows together as a location, as opposed to just kind of being a collection of screens. Each room feels like something that would conceivably be located inside of the castle. One of my favorite rooms is the gallery, just because of how all the decor just becomes more and more destroyed as the fighting goes on, and everything respawns when you come back, so you can just always destroy that room. The atmosphere in these missions is very reminiscent of the first game. After exploring the castle's many hallways and braving the torture chamber, Mission 3 ends with the introduction of the Bianco Angelo, which are some of the more entertaining enemies to fight, and their introduction music does a really nice job of playing with the Nello Angelo nostalgia. Mission 4 revolves mostly around using a key item that you get at the end of Mission 3 to activate the gyro blades, and use them to complete the puzzle you ran by earlier. It's actually quite a bit of fun since the gyro blade can be weaponized. Just hit that sucker a couple of times and buster that thing and watch the enemies disappear. Once you finish the gyro blade puzzle, you're treated to a pretty decent boss fight against Bale. He's not the most exciting, but he's not super annoying, and he does fit the theme of the area pretty well. <sighs> Come on, it's just nasty. I feel like this mission is the best representative for the early levels in DMC1 because it contains the moment that I feel like once you reach it, you'll have decided if this game is for you. That moment being...
This is the part where I feel like when I first played the game I went, alright, I'm in. This cutscene is just so cool. The way that the shot just lingers on Dante for a little bit before he starts moving. When he pulls himself through the hilt of the sword, so many people cringed the first time they saw it, but it was just so cool looking. That cutscene aside, I feel like the level design and overall atmosphere in DMC1 are just on another level from the rest of the series. The tight corridors give off that claustrophobic feeling that wouldn't be out of place in a horror game from that time period. The background music does a good job of creating that feeling that there's just something wrong with the castle. And of course this feeling is confirmed when the puppets come to life and the wall chucks soars at you. This mission does a decent bit of foreshadowing too. To get the key to go to the room with the fountain in it, you have to go to the library. The key is located inside a painting of a Grim Reaper. Later when you're making your way back through the room after you've done your business in the mission, you're introduced to the Sin Scissors, by way of them coming out of the painting. It also foreshadows the lion statue that you'll be dealing with in a couple missions. It's all quite clever, really. So after taking a step outside of the castle for some fresh air for a couple of missions, Dante returns to the castle after night has fallen to find that it has changed. <laughs> Not cool. They even managed to make the creepy castle music even more unsettling during this stretch of the game. I decided to choose Mission 17 as the representative for this particular part of the game because it's the one I find to be the most exciting. This mission contains the introduction of the Frosts, a tennis match against a skeleton dragon, the final battle against Nello Angelo, and finally, the acquisition of the Sparta Sword. That's a lot of really cool stuff in one mission. There are some really cool environments in this level too. The corridor between the fight with Nello Angelo and the room with the Quicksilver in it is really cool because of the way that the windows let the moonlight in. The room that actually contains the Quicksilver is really cool because of similar reasons with the lighting. And the side area with the balcony is just really cool to look at while you stand there and gather the blue orb. And finally, the room that the boss takes place in is also spectacular. The giant window that shows the thunderstorm outside just adds to the gravitas of the fight. And the chair with the stairs is another nice bit of decoration that adds to my enjoyment of the room. Really, the final battle with Nello Angelo is just icing on the cake at this point. The final proper level in DMC1 does not disappoint. Living Cave is in fact an accurate description of the level, as the whole thing has a very organic belly of the beast motif going for it. Complete with weird vein-like tentacles that sap the life from you, fleshy doors that you have to cut open, and an evil jaw-like thing that will try to take a bite out of you if you stand too still. And a giant heart that acts as the key that you need to activate to open up the final door. It's really disappointing that the series never really captured this kind of feel for the underworld again. In 2 it just kind of looked like any other generic evil world, and the third game's underworld levels just kind of teleport you from place to place. This level actually feels like one cohesive location. Something that really clinches this for me is the music. It really drums up the feeling that this level is one final climactic push before you confront Mundus. This level also does what so many other levels in the game like to do. It shows you the goal at the beginning and then makes you take the scenic route. This scenic route is a claustrophobic journey filled with nobodies and tentacles. The nobodies were a good choice for the bulk of the enemies in this level since they're a good bit more challenging than most of the other demons in the game, and they fit the level's motif the best. Once you reach the end of the tunnel, you hop over some lava and do some elevator climbing. For some reason, the enemies in this room are the plasmas, and I'm not really sure why. I feel like they kind of clash with the level, and it may be something like a death scythe would have been better in their place since that's a challenging enemy, and it's the last room before you flip the switch. After the lava room, you reach the switch and you start the gigantic heart, and you get to watch this really satisfying sequence of all the barrier hands on the final door breaking. The greatest compliment I can give to the first Devil May Cry's level design is that it manages to create and maintain a sense of tension and atmosphere, while still switching the themes of the levels to prevent you from getting bored. As soon as you start to get used to the creepiness of the castle, you get sent outside. The outdoors becoming a little too comfortable? Well come on back into the castle, but now it's all screwy. Screwy castle not weird enough? Come into the underworld where even the floor itself will try to kill you. Just think about it. Can you imagine what a level like Mission 21 would look like in Devil May Cry 5?